but it has so been the stop the watching people Fox people or CNN or whatever you watch with a fake news. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the latest edition of TRD Talks Live. My name is Georgia Cromroy. I'm a reporter at The Real Deal, and I'm going to be moderating our discussion tonight. Um, I'm very happy to be joined by State Senator Julia Salazar, Sherwin Belkin, an attorney at firm Belkin Burden Goldman, Sia Weaver from Housing Justice for All, and Francis Greenberger, CEO of real estate firm Time Equities Incorporated, which has a portfolio that includes about 5,000 apartments. Um, so we're really pleased that we can offer these panels for free um, three times a week, thanks to our sponsors, but not everyone can be a sponsor. So if you enjoy the work that we do at The Real Deal, please go to our website and subscribe so we can continue to bring you these live events. Um, now we're going to have a brief message from our sponsor, Lou Bogier from Vero. Lou? Appreciate it. So first and foremost, a big thank you to The Real Deal for organizing this wonderful webinar. I'm going to jump right into it. Clarity in our real estate business is a rarefied commodity these days. What's going on in our communities demands a new approach to understanding how we can work together to overcome these incredibly difficult circumstances. So with this in mind, Vero and I are proud to announce a brand new product that introduces transparency in a time of tremendous opacity to bring owners and operators and renters together. Our income and asset verification tool is the first and only product to confirm an existing renter's potential income disruption as a result of the COVID-19 health crisis. Mm -hmm. In minutes, we can securely tell an operator who is in a position of financial hardship using fraud-proof information straight from the person's bank account. Here's how it works. Vero partners with renters to provide a seamless workflow that safely transmits a financial snapshot pulled securely from their bank account to the manager. This snapshot includes direct deposit information and existing cash balances. So no more sending sensitive banking PDFs via an insecure email, no more moving goal posts to prove how times are actually tough. On the manager side, we offer a clear legible report of their renter's income or potential income disruption in addition to their existing assets. This is best in class data on how they can work with a renter to offer assistance on a case by case basis. The most important result of our process is a sense of transparency where both parties can honestly engage with one another to find a mutually beneficial resolution. We're offering free onboarding and training for the next 30 days, so please take advantage of the opportunity. Check out savevero.com for a demo today. Thanks, and back to the panel. Thanks, Lou. Um, so the topic of tonight's discussion is really rent. Um, we've brought together representatives from property owners and landlords, as well as tenant advocates and a legislator who has been really the tip of the spear for the progressive tenant agenda. Um, we have a lot of ground to cover and it's all right if we don't find a whole lot in common, um, we're going to talk about the issues. So um, first, can each of you talk a little bit about how your work has changed um, since the coronavirus pandemic began and how you connect with your members, your residents, constituents, or clients, whatever the case may be? Um, Sherwin, can we start with you? Uh, yes, starting with uh, the onset of the pandemic, um, my firm began operating remotely. Um, I've had clients pretty constantly reaching out to me over the past weeks via phone, via email, asking the question, how do we deal with this? And what I hear from most owners is they want to identify who's suffering from hardship versus those who are not mm -hmm. and trying to derive some payment program. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Sia, what, what does the picture look like for you? Um, it looks like uh, tenants have been organizing a lot over Zoom. What other, um, what other new ways of organizing have you, been, have you been using right now? Yeah, we've been organizing over Zoom. So we have many, many Zoom meetings um, that have been extraordinarily well attended. I think the number one thing for me that's dramatically different from, from six weeks ago and today is that the amount of interest in the housing justice movement has skyrocketed. So we are on a daily basis engaging with more and more and more people than ever before. Um, and our partner organizations and Housing Justice for All are as well. Cool. Francis, um, what, how has your firm uh, made the shift to working during the coronavirus pandemic? Well, uh, um, as uh, most people, uh, we are, we've shifted to be online and people are working, sheltering 
uh, at home where they are and uh, working uh, full schedules and extra long schedules mm -hmm. to cope with all of the aspects of the virus. In our case, uh, our asset management teams have really become rent relief management teams. And uh, uh, like so many, we're trying to um, figure out how to use the limited amount of rents that actually is in our discretion uh, um, uh, to offer relief to those most in need. Um, as you know, landlords have, uh, property owners have a lot of operating expenses that they pay. Uh, in New York City, 40% of net rents go to uh, city right. and tax. Right. We'll, we'll get uh, into that a little, so we'll we have get into that a little bit later. Okay. Um, okay. Senator Salazar, how have you been connecting with your constituents in the past six weeks? Yeah, um, for nearly a month now, our office operations have been entirely remote, virtually entirely remote. Uh, so all of our district and legislative staff are working remotely just for the sake of public health. Um, and, and that means really moving a lot of meetings to Zoom, uh, pretty consistent with with what other offices have had to do um, but but actually the the load um, and and the amount of, of work that we need to do in order to help constituents has definitely increased according to people's needs right so what about the state legislature it looked like um, you guys were not going to return to session until mid-may is that how are you guys connecting how are you talking talking to each other right now? <laughs> Yeah, uh, now that mid-May is only a couple of weeks away, uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's a little unclear when we will resume voting on legislation, but we've been actively conferencing remotely over Zoom. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. so, um, so let's dive into some of the policy proposals that, um, that are on the table. Um, the state has limited authority over lending institutions, especially those not chartered in New York. Um, so Sherwin, um, what kinds of conversations are your clients having with their lenders right now? And what do you think about proposals from, um, from Senator Salazar, from others that would um, cancel rent or reduce, um, reduce rent and cancel or reduce mortgage payments? I think Senator Salazar's bill actually proposes a, a reduction of property taxes um, as, as well as mortgage payments, um, depending on what, what financial um, financial loss they have from um, from rents that can be documented. So, so really, what's what's the rub for you from from the real estate industry's perspective? If you can tell us what's wrong with those proposals, um, and maybe what you would like to see instead. Okay, <clears throat> I think the proposal has very indefinite criteria as to who is a COVID nineteen hardship victim. Um, the proposal talks about 100% forgiveness of rent, and in exchange for that, owners get relief in real estate taxes, but the real estate tax relief is capped at 10%, so it's not exactly, um, you know, a quid pro quo. Owners are being asked to give up 100% of rent for dribs and drabs of some relief, and that relief of real estate taxes is not adequate to fully address the panoply of expenses that owners have. So, um, J Senator Salazar, do you have any thoughts on that assessment of your of your proposal? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say that it isn't intended to be quid pro quo. That um, that it's actually the intention of S eighty one ninety, the bill that I introduced, is to provide relief for people who are going to be hit most immediately, tenants as well as homeowners who have outstanding mortgage payments, um, and, and property owners who have outstanding mortgage payments, um, as well as nonprofit affordable housing providers, um, and and so the. Uh, potential property tax relief is not intended to be proportionate per se to the um, amount of, of rent that a property owner necessarily lost. And it also is not the only relief um, that's potentially provided 
for property owners. Um, they can they will also be able to apply for additional assistance um, if they can demonstrate that that they've lost rent uh, from their tenants um, or have otherwise suffered really severe financial hardship from the crisis. Got it. Um, can I can I ask about the assistance? Because the the assistance is predicated upon securing state or federal funding. Mm -hmm. is, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Is is there any assistance that um, unemployment insurance? Where's the funding coming from? Is is there is there any policy proposal that that is um, that is viable without increased federal assistance? That's that's a that's a good point. Um, yeah, I, I would say that we absolutely need increased federal assistance at this point. Um, there, we're projecting that it's going to take years for New York State to recover from this crisis. Billions at this point, you know, we were already, of course, going into this crisis with a with a deficit as a state, uh, and we're anticipating many more, you know, tens of billions at minimum in additional. Uh, damage um, financially from from COVID nineteen crisis. So I think that it's absolutely essential that we that we push for more federal funding. And I, I think that any of these proposed solutions will be impossible without mm. both federal additional federal funding and ideally some kind of increase in revenue to the state. But it, it it so it seems that um, that property taxes is is the one thing that the um, state has total control over and and um, maybe maybe correct me on this if if um, if you feel otherwise Francis and Sherwin but um, but um, the real estate industry maybe feels that that is the is the thing that is the um, the the surest um, possibility. Um, is is that the sense? Is that the sense you have, Francis? Well, uh, look, the uh, the city has been increasing its proportionate share of net rents. By net rents, I mean after operating costs, mm -hmm. dramatically mm -hmm. over the last several years. It used to be twenty percent, and now it's forty percent. Um, you know, I don't know where they see the limit in in how much tax that they can assess. Uh, um, uh, because there are all of the capital costs that housing involves that have to be paid in addition. So uh, I, I think that unfortunately that uh, a lot of that addition potential capacity has been been used up. And uh, um, but I also think we all know that uh, somewhere somehow over the fullness of time tax revenue is going to have to be increased to pay back all of this money that government is using. Mm -hmm. uh, and that will come from everybody. And the that's, reason a, that's, a good, that's a good point. Sia, if we can get you in here, um, how, how, do you, how do you persuade city and state governments to, um, I mean, what, what you want, what, what tenant, the tenant movement wants um, is to cancel rent, but a third of the city's revenue comes from property taxes. So really, you know, how do you, how do you make the case to the government to, um, diminish their their biggest source of funding? So we don't actually see canceling rent as uh, necessarily meaning that we want to cancel property taxes. I actually think it's really critically important that that we continue to that the state continues to collect property taxes that the city continues to collect property taxes and i our organization supported um an entire suite of bills that would have increased taxes on the extraordinarily wealthy in order to pay for more goods and services um in the state legislature this year um unfortunately those revenue measures were not passed as part of the state budget but we would and will continue to support them. Um, in addition, we are calling for a landlord hardship fund. Um, we do think that, you know, some landlords can afford to 
you know, four or three months of rent and some cannot, right? We just want the onus to be on the property owner to open their books, to prove that they need resources. And, and we believe that um, a landlord hardship fund funded by federal money is really critically important as part of the cancel rent strategy. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so that's an int- interesting point. If there are, so, so the tenant, um, tenant advocates that are engaging in rent strikes in New York City have targeted um, specific landlords that they deem to be able to take the hit, landlords who can afford um, and their view to skip um, a month or more um, in their in their rent collections. Um, does that mean that there are some landlords that are more or less deserving of rent strikes? And by the same token, does that mean that there are tenants that are more or less deserving of rental assistance? Where do you, this is a question maybe for both um, Senator Salazar and, and Sia. Sure. So I guess I want to say a couple of things. First, um, there is an extraordinarily long history in this state and the city and in this country of renters having to prove hardship to get access to a variety of social services programs. Um, Section 8, um, every single rental assistance program, basically, period. So that is the status quo. And so what we're fighting for in this moment is given how extraordinarily quickly the crisis came on and given that renters have dramatically lost income and landlords actually do have more stability, right? Having an asset, having wealth gives you a bit more stability than having no asset. Um, that's why we're calling on it on the on the on the landlord industry to have to prove hardship rather than renters. Renters are already having to prove hardship every single day. Um, so that's like the first thing. And then the second thing is like when it comes to the question of rent strikes, I want to be super clear that um, tenants are unable to pay rent. Period. And when we say rent strike, what we're saying is we're turning a moment where people cannot pay into a moment of like sort of political activity and asking and, and turning our, our individual inability to pay into collective action, calling on the government to intervene. Um, that's the point of the rent strike. And so, um, so I think, you know, it's, there are certainly landlords that can absorb, absorb, three months of non-payment of rent more than some other landlords, right? But um, that's sort of neither here nor there when you're a tenant who's lost your income and you don't know what you're going to do on uh, May 1st, June 1st, whatever. Mm -hmm. So Sherwin, um, what... What are you advising your clients to do in the case of a rent strike? Um, Do you think this is something that um, your clients should take seriously? Is this, is this something that, um, that, that you're seeing affecting a lot of uh, rental property owners? Um, Is it, or is it, is it, is it disparate? Is it, um, you know, it's going to affect some more than others, but, but not be so across the board. How How do you see it from your perspective? Uh, I see most most of my clients being impacted by some tenants that are incapable of paying rent right now, and my clients are trying to work with them. What I do find difficult to understand, other than a as a political squeeze play, is telling tenants who can afford to pay rent don't pay it, and. The notion that um, every tenant must prove hardship, as she had just indicated, that's not true. That's if you're in a low-income governmental support program. The problem is we're trying to shift a societal problem, which normally involves government, onto the back of property owners. And I, I would ask when you, you know, it's not just shelter that is in need. Food is a need, medicine is a need, clothing is a need, or is, is she is suggesting that whether it's Whole Foods or the local bodega, um, food, give me the loaf of bread, but I'm not paying for it. I need new shoes, but I'm not paying for it. Well, why is it that the property owner is the one that uh, is being made the subject of the strike? 
So um, that's that's a question maybe for um, for Senator Salazar or for, or for Sia. What do you what is particular about the real estate industry? Why is housing um, why is ho housing such a such a focus of your efforts? Um, and how is it different from from organizing for um, for for other things to be free too? Or do you want those things to be free as well? What's 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 the big deal with uh, with the real estate industry? I'll jump in really quick and, and certainly allow Sia to answer. Um, for what it's worth, I don't actually think that this should be unique to the real estate industry. Um, I've been part of uh, a coalition pushing for uh, the president to um, use the Defense Production Act to mandate that companies that produce goods that are really essential right now, including uh, uh, personal protective equipment, among other things um, that that are desperately needed in this crisis, that they will will actually need to provide it, um, and and it's not it doesn't translate directly to requiring um, uh, tenants to be able to you know forgo paying rent, but. I think that what this really comes down to is this is an unprecedented crisis and it is going to require an unprecedented solution. And also, uh, you know, in turn, action from the government to make that, that unprecedented response possible. So the burden is not really on uh, property owners or even the, the banks um, or mortgage servicers, but ultimately, I do think that it does need to be the responsibility of, of the federal government and the state government to make this possible. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think the reality here, and we are quite clear that we are calling for government intervention um, and we want the government intervention to come in at the level of the building and not at the level of the individual because at the level of the individual that is putting an onus on many, many, many vulnerable people who are struggling to get by. Um, so that is that is clear, and I think that's I think we're very clear that what we are asking for is government intervention to stabilize homes, right? And if we don't do something drastic, hundreds. The reality is, if we don't do something drastic now, hundreds and thousands of people are going to lose their homes. They will die, um, and we need an intervention that keeps people stably housed now. Um, for the last forty, for forever, for a long time. Um, a certain group of people have been able to generate wealth off of owning property, which creates options for some people and doesn't create options for others, right? Um, I think that's in the chat, landlords equal wealth. I, I, you know, it is just true. I think we all on this call could agree that in this country, people generate wealth out of own, owning land, right? Um, that's just true. And asking the folks who have generated wealth off of owning land for many years to um, give up a little bit during a time of great social need, great social need, while we fight for a government intervention is, is not that drastic of a, of a thing to want. So, um, so Francis and, and Sherwin, um, do you have any thoughts on, on that? How, how should the government intercede right now? What, what, kind, what kind of assistance should there be from the government? And, and maybe how likely do you think it is that, that we'll, that we'll, we'll see? I, I, you know, personally, I think that this is an unprecedented crisis. Uh, and uh, there are significant needs that different people have. Um, however, other people are not in that position for a wide variety of reasons. And, and the common sense of allocating uh, either government resources or private contributions as well, only to people who can demonstrate need uh, seems to me to be a fundamental uh, a concept and, and, and of course a fair concept. Uh, in the middle of this crisis, when there's so much need to say to people who don't need it, you know, there are lots of people who are being, while there, there's a high number of people that are unemployed, there's a majority, far, big, big majority of people who are employed and they're still getting paid. Uh, um, and there are also people who have real estate, land is not the only place that wealth is accumulated from. It's accumulated from a vast uh, um, uh, economy, technology, a million places. So, uh, um, and people who who are without need uh, to to give them relief is 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 nonsensical. So, 
uh, let's identify the real needs and let's address them through government help, through private help when possible, uh, um, rather than some blanket approach uh, um, that makes the problem uh, five times worse than, than it is. Yeah, I, could, I couldn't agree more. I think the, the very first notion needs to parse out those who are in real need and they should be helped from those who are not. Um, that, that's got to be first and foremost, because we, we have very scarce assets right now, scarce state assets, scarce federal assets, to put those assets across the board in the absence of need just is, is a lack of common sense. I actually think that there are you know, hundreds of billionaires in our state who we could be asking to pay a little bit more so that all of us could do better. And the reality is, is that what we know, um, and I'm not, this is not like, what we know, everybody, everybody could agree probably that if you are creating barriers to entry, there are people who are the most needy who are not going to get access. So people who maybe don't have documentation status, people who work in precarious jobs, people who maybe work in the cash economy um, as a server even in a restaurant who works on cash tips, right? Um, those folks are going to have a much harder time proving need in this moment. Um, and it's just actually... Uh, it, it's it, and, and are going to be unable to get resources they desperately need because of that, right? Um, so I think that the reality is here that like there are there's actually tons of wealth in this state and in this country. It's just being held at the top. And what we're talking about is getting that wealth to sort of flow a little bit towards everyone else at uh, at a at a better in a better way. So um, we have a question from, um, we have a lot of questions act actually from the audience, but one of them is from Kevin Shahiri. Um, and it looks, it looks like this is a question for Sia. How did you choose which landlords to target with rent strikes? And are you going to go after all of the housing they manage? And will you specify between affordable versus fair market? Um, by affordable, I assume you mean subsidy, subsidized versus fair market. Um, right, right. Yeah. So we are following the tenant organizing that's happening, um, to be honest with you. So there is active organizing happening in the portfolios that we end up um, working with and supporting, right? So we're following tenant organizers um, who are doing the work on the ground in communities and tenant leaders who are doing the work on the ground in their buildings. Um, so that's the main way that we chose, but like the reality is, is that um, those are also big portfolios where we've examined the finances. We know that the landlords can sustain um, a few months of not collecting rent, right? How do you how do you know how, what what kind of analysis did you do? I mean, you don't have access to their balance sheets, so yeah. Uh, so what we did is we we are doing it through um, through basically looking at like buying and selling records um, in like it, it, like Acris, looking at people's mortgages and how the public that, public like, record public record public records okay. yeah okay. Um, yeah um, and so. I think just when it comes to the question of subsidized versus um, non-subsidized, what we are trying to do is expand the stock of subsidized housing. Um, and we are trying to get to cancel rents and get more resources in from the government to sustain the housing market. Um, and we want that to come with some pretty strict conditions around affordability and around, um, around long-term tenancy of people who are currently living there. Um, if housing is currently already subsidized, it's a lot easier to get for renters to be able to reduce the rents to something that they can afford. Um, so that housing is sort of less of a, less of a concern, right, than the rent regulated stock and the market rate stock. Interesting. Okay. All right. So, um, so for everyone, it's clear, especially if there are more rent strikes um, in a variety of different landlords' um, holdings, it's it's clear that sooner or later there's going to be some distress in the market. 
Um, and there are lots of entities who have been very clear that they have a ton of money to, um, to invest in distressed assets. So, um, so what does an outcome like that look like for both tenants and for landlords where you have larger firms coming in to buy up distressed properties? Is that for, um, for SIA and for Senator Salazar, is, is that something that you welcome? Is that an outcome that um, that will be better for tenants and and for um, for Francis and and for Sherwin. What does that process look like? How how soon do you think that could start um, could start happening? Um, and have you heard about it happening yet? Starting with Francis and, and Sherwin. Well, uh, um, you know, I've heard peripherally of, of investment groups coming together, thinking that there'll be bargains and trying to pursue them. Um, uh, I have not heard of su such actual transactions uh, uh, yet. Uh, it, it could happen. There's plenty of distress out there uh, without rent strikes. Uh, um, uh, you know, many retailers are closed, can't pay rents, uh, um, and there are uh, uh, individuals who have lost their jobs and they can't pay rents. So this is all, um, of course, falling immediately on the property owners without rent strikes and, and giving, giving away uh, uh, money to uh, people who don't need it. Uh, um, so there are plenty of problems and that can uh, result in, in, in property owner hardship. And some people might try to uh, uh, take advantage of it, um, uh, certainly, but I don't know any particular cases where that's happened, and it's not something that I would participate in uh, any which way. Um, uh, I just think that, well, I don't want to pee myself, but that we're creating some mass problem uh, rather than dealing uh, with with the relief that's actually needed. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Sherwin, are you are are you hearing clients of yours talk about talk about that? And do you think do you think that's a good income for the housing market? Well, what I'm hearing is more from the small and mid-sized property owner who is really wondering how they're going to make it through this process, where they do have a number of tenants that are suffering hardship, where they are working out payment plans for those tenants, but that's really straining the small and mid-sized property owner. And if there starts being too high a level of no rent coming in, they're really wondering how do they hang on? How do they maintain their building? How do they pay all the expenses? How do they keep their staff, their supers, their porters? How do they pay these people? You know, I, I keep hearing that rent should stop, but rent doesn't just go into some big property owner's pocket. It goes into a pocket, but then it gets dispersed among all sorts of people, porters, superintendents, doormen. You know, those people can't all be sustained absent the fuel of rent payment. Senator Salazar, Sia, do you what do you guys think about about the um, the workers that um, that maybe won't be able to be sustained if rent is not coming in and how and really and really all of the places that um, that that rent goes it's not just it's as as Sherwin said it's not just to the property owner. I can start. Um, yeah, I think there are different sort of business models that that different landlords use. Um, some I think are more responsible than others, um, but I don't think that it should be uh, our responsibility to address the needs of property owners in some cases who are relying on an irresponsible business model. For example, a business model that, and this isn't, you know, rare, but a business model that relies on being able to evict tenants, for example. Um, it's one thing for 
um, a, a landlord to invest in a property that's clearly going to be a rental property and expect tenants to pay rent in, in other circumstances. And, and quite another when we're talking about a, a very exploitative business model. And I don't think that we should be rewarding that uh, through public policy. Um, but w with regarding the expenses that property owners have, there are existing programs, just as there are for tenants who need financial relief, lost income to apply for. There are, are existing programs, namely tax abatements, uh, whether it's J51 or, or 421A that exist for property owners. And that's, you know, just the you know, two, two that come to mind. Um, that but actually, actually what, do you think, what do you think about the, those programs, Sherwin? I, I see you maybe have an opinion about yes. that. Yes. <laughs> so first of all, too, we're talking about COVID-19 and a rent strike. To immediately go into the landlord exploitive boogeyman, I just think it is inappropriate. 421A is for new construction. It has nothing to do with owners who are trying to uh, make it on a day-to-day -day basis. It's J51. J51 is for rehabilitating units. It has nothing to do with paying for your porters and your superintendents and your handymen. So... Those tax abatement programs don't do anything for the day-to-day -day expenses that owners are presently encountering. Do you think that... Go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, the question that I think of is, do you believe that those tax abatements have actually, in practice, exclusively been used for that purpose? Or have do you, do you believe that property owners have not taken advantage of these tax abatements um, in situations where they don't actually apply. Perhaps, you know, they were able to take advantage of it, but they didn't use the, the tax exemption or tax abatement to actually benefit their tenants and to maintain their building properly. Yeah, and just also on Julia's point, like there are many programs at HPD and at the state level that exist to help property owners stabilize their properties. There are hardly any programs for renters in this moment. There's just a reality that our public policy is structured around the rights and the benefits that come with property ownership, not around the rights of renters. And so trying to um, tip the scale back in the other direction is not a, not a crazy thing to want to do. Um, to the you, point on the you, original, uh, let's, let's, Sherwin, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, I was, uh, was just going to say you uh, can't have read the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act of 2019 and come to the conclusion that the rights of renters are not taken into account in this state. It was an extraordinary pro-tenant uh, bill and took many rights of renters into account. So I think there is a balance. Um, what, what I'm hearing, and I, keep, I think it's what Francis is also saying, we have real problems and we need to come up with real solutions and trying to engage in a let's change the world view today may not work if we have people who need help today and not a complete societal change. I'd also like to comment on the 421 and J51 uh, programs. If, if you know how the process actually works, they are given in reverse after the uh, specified new building is built or the improvement is made. Uh, and then you have to submit documents, checks, everything. And then once that's all reviewed, they then decide uh, how much to give you and whether you qualify. So the notion that somehow they give you the money and then people don't do it, that's just not how it, how it works administratively. It's done after the fact, not before the fact. All right, so I, I, missed, I missed a few seconds there as my internet froze, but we, we have just a couple of minutes left. Um, I wanted, I wanted to, um, to quickly summarize a, a few questions that have, that have come in. Um, I'm seeing a lot of questions from people wondering, um, it, this is for you and for Senator Salazar um, again. So what, what do you say to people who, who say that you are taking a crisis and, and um, using it to further a um, progressive agenda? I'm fighting for a progressive agenda all the time, but during and before, after, 
all around. Um, I think the reality is, is that what we are seeing in this moment is that um, we've been saying for a long time that we had an unstable housing market because people couldn't afford their rent and that everyone was just one paycheck away from being evicted. Um, what's happening right now is everyone's lost that paycheck at the same time. And now we're seeing we're on the precipice of a mass wave of evictions unless we take action. And so what this moment is showing us is that what we've been saying for a long time is actually true. So I think sort of heightening our calls for the solutions that we already wanted, like the good cause eviction bill, um, like so solutions that give renters a lot more stability in their homes are um, is what we need to be doing in this moment. I don't think that's political opportunism. I think that's actually like stepping up to the plate in a moment that requires deep intervention. Francis and, and Sherwin, um, where, do, where do you fall on, on whether that's, um, that's appropriate or not to well, uh, I mean, start it's a not, rent strike during a, it, during a public it, health as crisis? I as I, I'm sorry. As I mentioned before, it, it's factually incorrect. Uh, she said that everybody lost their paycheck. Everybody did not lose our, their paycheck. I think 80% of the people are still employed and are still getting a paycheck. So now we're talking about the people who were uh, recently unemployed or laid off because their businesses were closed by governments. Those people are in a special category. As we know, in addition to everything else, they're getting heightened unemployment benefits during this period and benefiting from other government programs. So they're also not being left without any money. In fact, some people have said they get more from unemployment than they got working. I don't know whether that's true or not, but that's part of the narrative uh, that, that I've heard. But uh, I assume that isn't correct. Uh, however, uh, um, again, it's an exaggeration of the problem rather than focusing on real needs. Sherwin? Uh, uh, I couldn't agree more. I think we need to come up with real solutions for people that are truly suffering hardship. The painting, the broad brush of everybody has lost their job. Nobody can afford to pay their rent. Everyone is about to be homeless is a disservice to those actually suffering hardship. When my client gets a call from someone in their home in the Hamptons saying, I'm not paying rent because I don't want to, that that's not a good situation. Those that can't afford to pay should pay for the rent, just like they pay for their food and their clothing and all the other essentials of life. So, um, so one thing that we have we've covered um, today, we found out about this yesterday. There is an online petition circulating to um, get landlords to withhold their property taxes. Sherwin and Francis, do you think that is an appropriate response to rent strikes? Um, do you do you see um, do you take that seriously? Um, I I did not recognize any of the names on the petition as large. Um, um, New York City landlords, but um, but 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 how realistic do you think that possibility is? And do you think do you think that's an appropriate response to rent strikes? You know, no, I don't think rent strikes are appropriate, and I don't think tax strikes are appropriate. That's not an appropriate response to the problem. Med relief that's directed where there are real needs. Uh, um, to use the limited resources that we have, that's appropriate. Sherwin, what do you think? Property tax uh, strike? Uh, I only know what I read about the tax strike. Um, it, didn't, it didn't hit me as something that was appropriate at this time. I think we need solutions. I don't think rent or tax strikes are the way to go. All right. Well, um, we're going to leave it there. This concludes our uh, TRD Talks Live. Thank you so much to each of our panelists, Francis Greenberger, Sherwin Belkin, Sia Weaver, and Senator Julius Alazar. Thank, Thank you for having us. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.